Hello there, my love. You're in bed already? You want me to read you to sleep, huh? I, it's just, I've never done this before. I suppose it won't hurt. Hold on. All right, then, let's see what I've got. Here's this old one my mother used to read to me. Here we go, love. Get comfortable. The Adventures of Miss Minette and Master Jocko. Jocko, a very mischievous rouge, and a very pretty young cat called Minette, were inmates of the same house. One day, Jocko, wishing to divert himself, commenced his tricks by wishing Miss Minette a very good morning. She, recognising in him a neighbour, answered with a smile and a very polite meow. The usual compliments respecting the weather being over, out Hero bethought him that Miss Puss's moustaches were rather long for a lady, and seeing apparatus for shaving on a table close by, came to the determination of trying his skill as a barber. So seizing the box of soap in one hand and the lather brush in the other, he, after a few preliminary flourishes, began in a very masterly style to lather the face of Miss Puss very vigorously, directing her to keep her head back and mouth shut. Fortunately, the razor had been removed, and no doubt that prevented a dire catastrophe, as razors are very dangerous playthings in the hands of unskillful persons. But Jocko found a paper cutter, or ivory knife, which appeared to be just the thing he wanted. Therefore, taking Miss Puss by the nose with one hand, he began to scrape the lather and beard with the other, but as he was not very expert at the business, Miss Puss put her back up and told him very plainly that she didn't like his manner of shaving. Oh, oh, says Jocko, keep quiet, my dear. But I won't, replied Puss. Saying this, she made a spring right over his head and would have escaped had the door of the room not been closed. Come, madam, said Jocko, I must and will finish my job, so you had better submit quietly, or I shall use force. Catch me if you can, says she. He made no reply, but gave a jump, and seized her in a moment, and spite of her resistance, quickly fastened her to a chair with a scarf belonging to his master. In vain she struggled and tried to scratch him. He dexterously avoided her claws and laughed at her meows. Then tucking a towel under her chin, he danced around his victim with all manner of antics and grimaces. The noise and din they made between them caused such an uproar in the house that Susan, the chambermaid, left her work in the kitchen and ran upstairs to see what it was that made such a racket. Ha! said Susan. Well, I never saw the like before in all my born days. Puss cried and Jocko chattered away at such a rate that it came near being the death of poor Susan. She laughed until the tears came out of her eyes and started off saying, I'll bring mistress here to see the fun. As she went upstairs, Jocko seized poor Minette in his arms out of the window in all possible haste and in a moment reached the roof of the house with poor Minette in his arms. A crowd soon collected in the street and one man more venturesome than the rest procured a ladder and ascended in hopes of delivering poor Minette from her persecutor. But Jocko, seeing his intentions, snatched up a tile from off the roof and pelted the poor man so that he was glad to descend the ladder amid the jeers and hurrahs of the people gathered below, who, though it was fine fun that a monkey should prove himself too much for a man, so that the very people who encouraged him to ascend now made sport of him for the attempt. Jocko, now thinking himself, promenaded up and down the roof, coquetting with Miss Minette. Then taking the towel, he wiped the soap suds off her face and showed her to the grinning folks who now had collected to the number of some hundreds. Such laughing and screaming never was heard in that quiet street before and Jocko grinned at all sides and appeared very much delighted that he should be such an object of universal admiration. In fact, he showed that he must be considered a personage of the greatest importance. In the meantime, a ladder had been raised at the back of the house and another man ascended and nearly reached Jocko, who was grinning at the people in front. But the man making a slight noise caused Jocko to turn his head, and seeing his danger, sprung with Minette in his arms on top of the chimney, but the smoke rising out of the chimney blinded Jocko, and down the flue he tumbled, still holding on to Puss as he disappeared. 
The people all raised a great shout and the man on the roof looked down the chimney, shook his head and came down the ladder. The chimney led directly into a chamber where lay a sick man troubled sore with the gout and he was groaning for relief when down tumbled our hero and his companion out of the fireplace on the floor in front of the poor old gentleman. And as in their passage down the chimney, she had gathered a goodly coat of soot, and you can well imagine the figure these two animals made, all black as jet and their eyes glistening like coals of fire. It was enough to frighten the wits of a well person, letting alone a sick man. This poor old gentleman had not been able to rise out of bed for many months, but the frightful objects before him scared him so much that forgetting his gout, he sprang out of bed with as much agility as Jocko or Minette could have displayed and without so much as ever looking at his tormentors to see what they were. He sprang to the door, opened it in great haste and rushed downstairs closely followed by Master Jocko and his smut begrimed companion. In the room below lived Dr. Rhubarb. Our sick man made all haste and rushed in without knocking, closely followed by Jocko and Minette. The former sprung upon the sick man's shoulder and taking his cap off his head, threw it into the doctor's face. Minette, following suit, jumped on the back of the poor doctor. The doctor cried, thunder! The sick man called for the watch. Jocko chattered, puss squalled, and altogether such another din was never heard out of Bedlam. The doctor and his patient started for the door, but the latter, having his feet muffled up, stumbled and fell, and away went the doctor, head over heels, each one shouting thaves, murder, robbers at the top of their voice. The neighbours, alarmed by noise, rushed into the house armed with pokers, tongs and everything that came handiest. But what was their surprise, instead of finding robbers, to see only the doctor and the sick man sprawling and kicking on the floor. They raised them up and inquired what was the matter, but neither could explain what their enemies were. The mystery was soon solved by the entrance of the master of the delinquents. It is my monkey and my cat I fear that has caused you all this trouble, said he, but I hope they have you no harm. But where are the culprits? They must be hid somewhere in this room. So they searched all over, under the tables, up in the closets. At last, their master bethought him of the chimney, and there, sure enough, sat very quietly the two poor creatures, as demure as if they never had done a wrong thing in all their days. The frightful appearance of poor Pug and Miss Puss turned all their anger into merriment, and they all set up such a shout of laughter when they heard the sick man address the doctor in this wise. Doctor, these animals have done you much harm, and me a great deal of good, for see, I'm cured in a few minutes of the gout which you have been trying a year to cure to no purpose. And then he began to caper and dance around the room like a young girl, making obeisance to Jocko Miss Minette, who returned the civility in a very polite manner. The doctor readily assented to the wonderful cure, but had his doubts whether any apothecary in the city could be induced to keep cats and monkeys for the use of faculty. To show that he bore no malice, he shook hands with Master Jocko, who then departed with his master and Miss Minette, each party consoling themselves with the old adage of all's well that ends well. Uh, how did I do, love? Was that all right? Oh, okay. Well... There's another story in this book. I'll read that too. The Adventures of Dame Trot and Her Wonderful Cat. Dame Trot came home one winter's evening quite hungry and trembling with cold. But her cat had lighted a good fire and nice roasted a fine fat fowl for the dame's supper. Oh, how happy the old lady was. The cloth was neatly spread, the juicy fowl smoking on the table and this marvellous cat set herself to the duty of carving it up. When the cloth was removed, the dame exclaimed, What a pity it is not to have something to drink. Miss Puss runs quickly for some wine, and soon returns with a bottle uncorked. But alas, Miss Puss took a glass herself, it soon got in her head. Here she is dancing, capering, throwing somersets and declaring she won't go to bed. But all things have an end, and see, the fun over, they have all sunk into a sound and peaceful slumber, excepting that the old lady snore rather loud. Early next morning, Miss Puss awakened the dame, who found breakfast all ready to do the honours of the table. Breakfast over, Dame Trot went out to visit to neighbour. On her return, she found Miss Puss and her friend Toby engaged in a game of cards. 
Another time she came in and found poor Toby with a piteous countenance, seated with his face covered with soap suds and half of it shaved by the mischievous cat. Puss, having finished her shaving, dressed herself very gaily with a hat and feather on one side and a rich crimson dress set off with an elegant tippet. She had just finished when Dame Trot came in, who in admiration made her a very low courtesy, which Puss returned with charming grace. And so they lived very happily together for many years, though truth compels me to add that Miss Puss, though a very great coquette and an acknowledged beauty, remained and died an old maid. She flirted with our friend Toby for many years, but Toby getting tired one day went off with a mate, which so affected Miss Puss that she took to her bed and never got up again. What the? I don't remember that one being so... Morbid. <laughs> well, um, let's see what else I have here. Hmm, I guess this one will do. The Charmed Fawn. A little brother once took his sister by the hand and said, We have not had a happy hour since our mother died. Our stepmother beats us every day and if we go to her for anything she kicks us away. Our only food is the hard bread crusts that are left over. The dog under the table fares better than we do. She throws in many a good bite. Heaven help us. Oh, if our mother only knew what we suffer, come let us leave here and go out into the wide world. All day they wandered over fields and meadows and stony roads were very sad, and once when it rained, the little sister said, God and our hearts are weeping together. By evening they came to a large forest. Tired out with hunger, sorrow and the long journey, they crept into a hollow tree and fell asleep. The next morning when they awoke, the sun was high in the heavens and shone warm and bright into the tree. I am so thirsty, said the little boy to his sister. If I only knew where there was brook, I would get a drink. Hark, I think I hear water running. They climbed out of the tree and, taking hold of each other's hands, went to find the brook. Now the wicked stepmother was a witch and had seen the children go away and knew where they were. She had sneaked after them, as is the habit of witches, and had bewitched all the water in the forest. Soon the children found the little brook that sparkled and rippled over the stones. But just as the boy was stooping to drink, the sister heard, as if the brook murmured, Drink not of me, drink not of me, or to a tiger changed you'll be. So she begged of him not to drink the water, or he would become a wild beast and tear her to pieces. Thirsty as he was, the boy did as she wished, and said he would wait until they came to the next spring. Soon they came to another brook, and the maiden heard the waters whisper, Drink not of me, drink not of me or to a black wolf changed you'll be. And a second time the sister begged her brother not to drink the water, or he would be changed into a black wolf and devour her. Again, the brother did as she wished, but he said, I will wait until we come to the next brook, then I must drink, say what you will, or I shall die of thirst. But when they came to the third brook, the sister heard the cool water murmuring, Drink not of me, drink not of me, or to a young deer changed you'll be. And she cried, Dear brother, do not drink here, or you will be turned into a fawn and run away from me. But her brother had already knelt by the stream to drink, and as soon as the first drop passed his lips, he became a fawn. The little sister wept bitterly over her poor bewitched brother, and the little fawn also wept and kept close to her side. At last the maiden said, Do not cry any more, dear fawn, I will never leave you and she untied her golden garter and fastened it around his neck. Then braiding some rushes into a soft string, she tied it to the collar and led him away into the deep forest. After they had travelled a long, long distance, they came to a little cottage. The maiden looked in, and seeing it was empty, thought, we can stay here and live. She gathered leaves and moss and made a soft bed for the fawn. Every morning she went out into the forest to gather roots and berries and nuts for her own food and tender grass for the fawn, who would eat out of her hand and play happily around her. When night came and the little sister was tired, 
She would say her prayers, lay her head on the fawn's back for a pillow and sleep peacefully until morning. Their life in the woods would have been a very happy one if the brother could only have had his proper fawn. The maiden had lived a long time in the forest with the fawn for her only companion. When it happened, the king of the country held a great hunt. The loud blasts of the horn, the baying of the hounds, the lusty cries of the huntsmen sounded on every side. The young deer heard them and was eager for the chase. Please let me join the hunt, he said to his sister. I cannot restrain myself any longer. And he begged so piteously that at last she consented. At evening you must come back again, she said. But I shall have my door locked against those wild hunters, and that I may know you when you knock, say sister, let me in. If you do not say this, I shall not open the door. She opened the door and the deer bounded away, glad and joyful to breathe the fresh air and be free. The king and his huntsmen swathed beautiful animal and started in chase of him, but they could not catch him. And when they thought they had him safe, he sprang over the bushes and disappeared. As soon as it became dark, he ran to the little cottage, knocked at the door and cried, Sister, let me in. The door was quickly opened. He went in and rested all night on his soft bed. The next morning, the chase was continued. And when the deer heard the sound of the horn and the ho-ho of the huntsmen, he could no longer rest and said, let me out, sister, I must go. His sister opened the door, saying to him, you must return at evening and don't forget what I told you to say. As soon as the king and his huntsmen caught sight of the young deer with the golden collar, they all gave chase, but he was too quicksand nimble for them. All day long they followed him. Towards evening, the huntsmen surrounded him, and one of them wounded him a little in the foot, so that he limped and had to run more slowly. One huntsman followed him to the cottage and heard him cry, Sister, let me in. Then he saw the door open and quickly close again. The huntsman was astonished and went and told the king all he had seen and heard. Tomorrow, said the king, we will once more give him chase. But the maiden was very much frightened when she saw that the deer was wounded. She washed the blood from his foot and bound healing herbs on it and said, Go and lie down upon your bed now, dear fawn, that you may become strong and well again. But the wound was so slight that the next morning he felt nothing of it. When he heard the sound of the hunt again outside, he said, I cannot stay here, I must join them. They will not catch me so soon again. No, no, said his sister, weeping. You must not go. They will kill you, and I shall be left alone here in the forest, deserted by all the world. If I do no go, I shall die of longing, he said. When I hear the hunting horn, I feel that I must bound away. With a heavy heart, his sister opened the door, and the young deer went leaping joyfully through the woods. When the king saw him, he said to his huntsmen, Do not lose sight of him all day, but see that no one does him any harm. When evening came, the king said to his men, Come now, and show me where the cottage stands. They did so. Door knocked and cried, Sister, let me in. The door opened. The king entered and saw standing before him a maiden more beautiful than he had ever seen before. But how great was her astonishment to see, instead of the deer, a man wearing a golden crown. The king looked at her kindly and extending his hand said, Will you go with me to my castle and be my dear wife? Oh, yes, replied the maiden. I am willing to go, but the deer must go also. I can never leave him. He shall remain with you as long as you live and shall never want for anything, said the king. At this moment, the deer came bounding in. His sister again fastened the string of rushes to his collar and leading him by her own hand, they went out from the lonely cottage in the woods for the last time. The king placed the maiden upon his horse and rode with her to the castle, where the marriage was celebrated with great splendor, and she became queen, and they lived together happily for a long time, while the deer played in the castle garden and received every care and attention. In the meantime, the wicked stepmother, on whose account the children had been driven into the world, had no thought but that the little sister had been torn to pieces by wild animals, and that the boy whom she had turned into a fawn had been shot by the hunters. When she heard, therefore, of their good fortune, and how happy they were, she was filled with envy, and gave herself no rest until she had thought of a way to destroy their happiness. One day, her own daughter, who was as ugly as night and had only one eye, 
began to upbraid her mother bitterly because her stepsister was so much better off than she was, saying, Oh, if I had only been born a queen, be quiet now, said the old woman when the time comes. I shall be on hand, and you shall yet be a queen. The time came when a little son was born to the queen, and the king was away to the hunt. The old woman, taking the form of a nurse, entered the room of the queen and said, Come, your bath is ready. Let us be quick before it gets cold. Her daughter, who was also there, carried the queen into the bathroom, where they had made a suffocating fire, and leaving her there to die, closed the door and went away. This done, the old woman tied a cap on her own daughter's head and had her lie down in the queen's place. She gave her the form and appearance of the queen as nearly as she could, but the lost eye she could not restore, so she had her lie on the side where there was no eye. In the evening, when the king came home and heard that he had a son, he was greatly rejoiced and went at once to see the queen. But as he drew the curtain, the old woman cried, For your life do not draw that curtain, the queen cannot bear the light. So he went away without knowing that a false queen had taken her place. At midnight, when everyone was asleep, as the child's nurse sat alone by the cradle, she saw the door open and the true queen enter. She took the child in her arms, nursed it, and then laying it in its cradle again, covered it carefully, and went out. She did not forget the deer, but went to the corner where he lay and gently stroked his back, and then silently disappeared. In the morning, the child's nurse asked the guard if he had seen anyone leave the castle, but he said no, he had seen no one. The queen came many nights in this manner without speaking to anyone. The nurse saw her but said nothing to anyone about it. After some time had passed, the queen one night began to speak and said, How fares my child? How fares the deer? Twice more shall I come and then disappear. The nurse made no answer, but when the queen had gone, she went to the king and told him everything. Alas, said the king, what does this mean? Tomorrow night I will watch by the child. The next evening he went into the nursery and at midnight the queen came in and said, How fares my child? How fares the deer? Once more shall I come and then disappear. She took the child in her arms as usual and then went out. The king would not trust himself to speak, but he watched the following night and this time she said, How fares my child? How fares the deer? This time do I come and then disappear. But the king could hold back no longer and sprang towards her saying, You can be no other than my dear wife. Yes, I am your dear wife, she replied. And at that moment she was restored to life as well and beautiful as ever. Then she told the king how he had been deceived by the wicked witch and her daughter. He had them brought to judgment, and they were condemned to death. The daughter was driven to the forest where she was torn to pieces by wild beasts, and the old witch was led to the fire and miserably burnt. No sooner was she burnt to ashes than the young deer was restored to his human form, and the brother and sister spent the rest of their days happily together. I've always loved that story. You're not asleep yet. Um, well, how many stories must I read, love? Fine, okay, okay. I'll read a couple more. The Silver Ring. Calderon stopped abruptly in the middle of that long road across the moor. Something had caught his eye as he walked. The slightest possible glitter at the side of the road, where the heavy sunlight was making even the stones throw tiny, dense shadows. He went back a step, intent upon discovering what it was that had disturbed his casual glance. There, half raised by a small mound of hardened dust, was a ring, a plain silver ring, the sight of which struck him as a dagger might have done. As he picked it gently from the roadway and dusted it with his handkerchief, his fingers trembled. It was his wife's ring. He had given it to her before their marriage, a memento of an exquisitely happy day. All the time they had been together, she had worn it constantly. There had never been a time when she had not borne it upon her finger. The ring was full of memories for him, of memories that were painful now in their happiness, because they belonged to a broken time. And these memories pressed upon his heart, stabbing him as he stood thoughtfully in the roadway among the purple heather, gazing at the ring. His face had grown quite grey and hard, and his eyes were troubled. 
For a moment, he could do nothing but gaze at the ring, busy with his urgent thoughts. He could not yet wonder how the ring had come there, upon this lonely road from dale to dale. Behind him, the road was white, narrowing through the heather, unshadowed by any tree. To right and left of him, the moor stretched in purple masses until it darkened at the skyline. In front, the road began already to decline for the steep descent into Wensleydale. The grass could be seen ahead o' him, and beyond it, far in the burning mist of the late afternoon, he saw gleaming like quicksilver a sheet of water. The wind came at the great height in powerful gusts, freshening the air, pressing warmly against his face and hands as pleasantly as water presses against the swimmer. No other person was in sight upon the moor. He was alone, with Evelyn's ring in his hand and poignant memories assailing him. Calderon's love for his wife had been as intense and as true as any love could be. Her love for him, more capricious, more ardent, had been as great. Yet in the fifth year of their marriage, such was the conflict of two strong personalities, they had quarrelled vehemently and had parted. Both had independent means and both had many activities. Calderon had been working very hard for two years since the quarrel and they had not met. The two or three letters exchanged early in their estrangement had never suggested a continued correspondence. And although he knew that his wife had been living in the eastern counties, Calderon had now no idea at all of her whereabouts. How strange that he should find upon this lonely road that precious ring. Engraved within it, he read, Evelyn Maurice, the inscription she had desired. Calderon sighed, slipping the ring into his pocket and thoughtfully continuing upon his way. Was Evelyn before him? or behind him, who could tell? They had never been together to Yorkshire. He must go as a blind man. Then the question came to him. If they met, what had he to say to her? He knew no more of his journey down into Wensleydale for the passionate unreasonings that overwhelmed him. And then, when he was arrived in the little village to which the road over the moor leads, he again hesitated. So much depended upon his action. He must find Evelyn this evening, for his return to London was urgent. Already the shadows were growing long and the evening was heavy. Which way should he go? Upon his choice might depend the whole course of his future life. For a few moments he halted, irresolute. Then he went slowly forward to the first inn he saw, his fingers playing in his waistcoat pocket with the little ring that had suddenly plunged him into the past. He thought it certain that the loss of it was accidental. She would not have kept the ring for so long, and she could not have brought it with her to Yorkshire if she had intended to throw it away forever. And yet, how came it upon the moorland road? Calderon stopped outside the comfortable inn. It attracted him, but as though he had put some kind of reliance upon telepathy, he felt sure that Evelyn was not there. Should he enter, make inquiry? No, he knew she was not there. His steps led him forward, as if he were trying to follow some invisible thread, he went onward, pausing no more through the village over to the other side of the dale, marvelling at the heavy outline of Mount Caban, silhouetted against the sky. He found himself upon a good road with hedges on both sides. It was an adventure. He was following the bidding of his instinct. He did not really believe in it, Calderon told himself. It was too silly. There would be a disappointment, a sense of having been sold, and the morning would find him unsatisfied with his single opportunity gone. Yet even while his thoughts poured doubt upon his action, he was pursuing his way at a regular pace. How curious it was. It was as though there were two Calderons, one brain, the other overmastering instinct. You'll see, he warned himself, nothing will happen. You'll have an uncomfortable night and a trudge back in the morning. It's no good, no good. Yet he continued upon his way beside the silent hedges, his knapsack upon his shoulder, his arms swinging, and the silver ring hidden in his waist. Coat pocket. It was quite dark when he reached Bainbridge. He knew well the aspect of the open common because he had passed through it a dozen years before, and the place is unforgettable. There was a large green, he remembered, and the houses hedged the green as they did at East Whitton. He smiled at the memory and at the comparison. Yorkshire held such variety of scene from east to west that he could pick from among old associations a pleasant thought of every part of it. And here at Bainbridge, he knew there was an old inn, quiet and spacious, where he might find Evelyn. She was not one to seek the smaller inns, such as he would himself have chosen. She would endure the discomforts of loquacious companionship, 
rather than those of primitive bathing arrangements. Had it not then been instinct which had led him here? Had it perhaps been a subconscious guessing at her inclinations? Calderon could not discuss that now. He was here. It was too late to go farther. He must endure whatever disappointment might be in store for him. A bedroom was available, he was supplied with hot water, and he groomed himself as well as his small store of belongings allowed. Whimsically, he foresaw a number of women in semi-evening dress, one or two men in suitably dark clothes, himself the only palpable tourist. There would be a solitary meal as dinner time was passed, and he would then seek among the company the owner of the silver ring. Calderon found himself laughing rather excitedly, even trembling slightly. Well, he would see what happened. He ventured down the stairs, nervously grinning at the thought that Evelyn might appear from any one of the doors along that silent passage. When he reached the foot of the stairs, he went instinctively to the door to watch the two or three faint sudden lights that started across the green out of a general blackness. It was a very dark night. Clouds had come swiftly from the southwest and the sky was entirely hidden. There was a wind and he thought that as soon as it dropped, the rain might begin to patter. And then, while he was thus prophesying the weather, Calderon was held to the spot by a new sensation. Within, from some room which he had not entered, came an unknown voice, singing. The voice was sweet, but he did not listen. Only the air that was sung made him follow the voice, words forming in his mind, as though he were himself saying, the little silver ring that once you gave to me keeps in its narrow band every promise of ours. Surely he was dreaming. He could not move. The clouds hurried. The darkness enwrapped him. He could not smile at a coincidence because he could not believe that the song was really being sung. It was too much for him to take in. If Evelyn were there, what could she be feeling, thinking? Calderon was a very honest man and was considered generally a very cool, unsentimental one but he was easily moved by the one love of his life. Evelyn was the only woman for him. They were parted. He had found a ring which held just such associations, memories of the past, as the song pictured. The ring was more than a ring. It was not merely an ornament. It was the material sign of their love. Calderon was deeply stirred. Even as he stood there, not daring to move, he felt that he was not alone. Another figure, a woman's, stood in the doorway. He could see her light dress, the whiteness of her neck, and he found himself breathless, suffocated by the sudden denouement to his dream. Evelyn, he whispered, moving at last. There was a quick recoil. For a moment it seemed to Calderon that everything was lost and that he was alone. Then the woman in the doorway stood quite still, breathing quickly, half hidden from him by the doorpost, her face wholly invisible in the murk of the night. I didn't see anybody she said unsteadily. Who are you? It seemed an unfamiliar voice, rather strangled and more than a little scared. Ah, you're not Evelyn, Calderon cried. Still, he could not see her. Only the whiteness glimmered before him. I'm... My name's Calderon. I beg your pardon. I thought it was my wife. Calderon, said the voice, and it seemed to him that it was suddenly filled with a new warmth, as of gaiety. Then... How funny, said the unknown. He seemed to see her head quickly lowered and averted. Was she smiling? Who could have told in that fog-like darkness? It was as much as he could do to see that she was still before him. But funny? What did that mean? Funny? He exclaimed eagerly. Is... He pulled himself up. Here was a complication. If he asked any question, might he not make a new difficulty? He could not ask whether Evelyn was here. He could guess how quickly a story would run through a mischievous party of tourists unrestrained by any real understanding of the situation, and bent upon canvassing among themselves, merely to beguile gaps in a mealtime conversation, the history of an unhappy marriage. He could not expose Evelyn to such a company, so he went no further with his speech. Perhaps you've heard, said the voice, perhaps you've heard of Alice Bradshaw. She was quite recovered from her shock, and was ready, it appeared to Calderon, to hold him flirtatiously in the doorway. I've known Evelyn for some time, two years. I've got an idea, hesitated Calderon, racking his brains and lying. It was getting worse, arid worse. How could he go on without showing how little he knew about Evelyn's recent movements? He frowned and smiled nervously on the darkness. He was rather glad of the darkness. 
I, it's possible. But not probable, said the laughing voice. Don't pretend to remember me if you don't. Well, I don't, admitted Calderon, and that's quite true. Honest man, said the voice. Something made him move forward quickly. The figure disappeared. Calderon, putting his hand instinctively forward to stop her, allowed the little ring to jerk from it. Oh, he cried. Here, I say. He was down upon his knees, fumbling on the ground. A match flickered on his fingers. He looked quickly up, hoping to see the unknown's face, but the match was blown out instantly by the strong wind that was pressing and fluttering about him as he knelt. What have you dropped? asked the voice. The mysterious one had reappeared in the doorway. A ring, Calderon said sharply. A ring. There was sympathy in the voice. What a pity, let me look. He struck another match and groped about. It was unavailing. The match went out, and beyond a sudden glimpse of the trodden earth, he had seen nothing. It's really your fault, Calderon said to the unknown, for starting away. Was it on your finger? No, it isn't mine. It's a silver ring. A silver. There was a moment's startled pause. Did you hear the song just now? Yes. Oh. With the third match, he had detected the ring. Good. Is it your ring? Asked the voice. I mean, Evelyn wears one, doesn't she? Does she? Calderon asked dryly. She did. Oh, she... I found it on the moor. This is hers. I brought it. Calderon checked himself again. He was rubbing the ring with his handkerchief in case it had been dirtied. How did you know we were here? Said the voice in a tone of piquant curiosity. Then, cried Calderon, feeling his face get very hot. He could have shouted at this confirmation of his most rosy hopes. It was with a terrible effort that he restrained himself. Oh, he said vaguely, one does know. He heard a real laugh this time, but smothered as though the unknown were holding a handkerchief to her mouth. Evidently, she said. But how does one know? How do you know that Evelyn didn't tell me? He parried. He felt it was a master stroke. You don't seem to have exhausted the possibilities. No, of course, she might have, admitted the mysterious voice. There was the tiniest silence. But I don't think she did. Of course, I don't know. No, of course, Calderon politely agreed. Is she quite well? Oh, cried the voice, shaking with amusement. Don't you know that? Hasn't she told you that? It's too bad to keep it from you. What? Calderon moved nearer. She's not ill. No, I meant that she was well. She tells me very little about herself. Very little, he explained ingeniously. You'll have noticed that she doesn't think of herself at all. A dryness came into the tone of his companion. You still idealize her then, Calderon heard. Yes. You see, it's an odd thing, he went on, and one doesn't talk about it. But you see, I'm in love with her. There was another pause, a significant pause. I think you're very forgiving, at last, said a muffled voice. I, what I should like to know, Calderon answered as if weighing his words, is whether she's also very forgiving. Oh, said the voice, now very low. You must ask her that. I do, Calderon ventured. Are you? Oh, Maurice, you're crushing me cried the unknown suddenly. There Alice has finished singing. She'll be coming. Give me my ring. Oh, my dear, of course I do. The ring was restored to rest in its old position until memory's course should be run. Oh, my love, you're already dozing off. I'll read one more just for you, my gorgeous. Here we go. How about uh, this one? Little Nell. The house was one of those receptacles for old and curious things which seemed to crouch in odd corners of the town. And in the old, dark, murky rooms, there lived alone together an old man and a child, his grandchild, little Nell. Solitary and monotonous as was her life, the innocent and cheerful spirit of the child found happiness in all things. And through the dim rooms of the old curiosity shop, little Nell went singing, moving with gay and lightsome step. But gradually over the old man, to whom she was so tenderly attached, there stole a sad change. He became thoughtful, dejected, and wretched. He had no sleep or rest but that which he took by day in his easy chair, for every night and all night long he was away from home. At last a raging fever seized him, and as he lay delirious or insensible through many weeks, Nell learned that the house which sheltered them was theirs no longer that in the future they would be very poor, that they would scarcely have bread to eat. At length, the old man began to mend, but his mind was weakened. As the time drew near when they must leave the house, he made no reference to the necessity of finding other shelter. But a change came upon him one evening as he and Nell sat silently together. 
Let us speak softly now, he said. Hush, for if they knew our purpose, they would say that I was mad and take thee from me. We will not stop here another day. We will travel afoot through the fields and woods and trust ourselves to God in the places where he dwells. The child's heart beat high with hope and confidence. To her it seemed that they might beg their way from door to door in happiness, so that they were together. When the day began to glimmer, they stole out of the house and passing into the street stood still. Which way? asked the child. The old man looked irresolutely and helplessly at her and shook his head. It was plain that she was thenceforth his guide and leader. The child felt it, but had no doubts or misgivings, and putting her hand in his, led him gently away. They passed through the long, deserted streets, until these streets dwindled away, and the open country was about them. They walked all day and slept that night at a small cottage where beds were let to travellers. The sun was setting on the second day of their journey, when, following a path which led to the town where they were to spend the night, they fell in with two travelling showmen bound for the races at a neighbouring town. They made two long days' journey with their new companions. The men were rough and strange in their ways, but they were kindly too, and in the bewildering noise and movement of the race course, where she tried to sell some little nosegays, Nell would have clung to them for protection, had she not learned that these men suspected that she and the old man had left their home secretly, and that they meant to take steps to have them sent back and taken care of. Separation from her grandfather was the greatest evil Nell could dread. She seized her opportunity to evade the watchfulness of the two men, and hand in hand, she and the old man fled away together. That night, they reached a little village in a woody hollow. The village schoolmaster, attracted by the child's sweetness and modesty, gave them a lodging for the night, nor would he let them leave him until two days more had passed. They journeyed on when the time came that they must wander forth again by pleasant country lanes. The afternoon had worn away into a beautiful evening when they came to a caravan draw up by the road. It was a smart little house upon wheels, and at the door sat a stout and comfortable lady taking tea. The tea things were set out upon a drum covered with a white napkin, and there, as if at the most convenient table in the world, sat this roving lady, taking her tea and enjoying the prospect. Of this stout lady, Nell ventured to ask how far it was to the neighbouring town, and the lady, noticing that the tired child could hardly repress a tear at hearing that eight weary miles lay still before them, not only gave them tea, but offered to take them on in the caravan. Now this lady of the caravan was the owner of a wax work show and her name was Mrs. Jarley. She offered Nell employment in pointing out the figures in the wax work show to the visitors who came to see it, promising in return both board and lodging for the child and her grandfather and some small sum of money. This offer Nell was thankful to accept and for some time her life and that. Of the poor, vacant, fond old man passed quietly and almost happily one night, Nell and her grandfather went out to walk. A terrible thunderstorm coming on, they were forced to take refuge in a small public house where men played cards. The old man watched them with increasing interest and excitement until his whole appearance underwent a complete change. His face was flushed and eager, his teeth set. He seized Nell's little purse and in spite of her entreaties joined in the game gambling with such a savage thirst for gain that the distressed and frightened child could almost better have borne to see him dead. The night was far advanced before the play came to an end, and they were forced to remain where they were until the morning. And in the night, the child was awakened from her troubled sleep to find a figure in the room. It was her grandfather himself, his white face pinched and sharpened by the greediness which made his eyes unnaturally bright, counting the money of which his hands were robbing her. Evening after evening after that night, the old man would steal away, not to return until the night was far spent, demanding wildly money, and at last there came an hour when the child overheard him, tempted beyond his feeble powers of resistance, undertake to find more money to feed the desperate passion which had laid hold upon his weakness by robbing Mrs. Jarley. That night, the child took her grandfather by the hand and led him forth, sustained by one idea that they were flying from disgrace and crime. 
and that her grandfather's preservation must depend solely upon her firmness, the old man following, as though she had been an angel messenger sent to lead him where she would. They slept in the open air that night, and on the following morning some men offered to take them a long distance on their barge. These men, though they were not unkindly, drank and quarrelled among themselves to Nell's inexpressible terror. It rained too heavily, and she was wet and cold. At last they reached the great city whither the barge was bound, and here they wandered up and down, being now penniless, and watched the faces of those who passed, to find among them a ray of encouragement or hope. They laid down that night, and the next night too, with nothing between them and the sky. A penny loaf was all they had had that day, and when the third morning came, it found the child much weaker, yet she made no complaint. Faint and spiritless as they were, the streets were insupportable, and the child, throughout the remainder of that hard day, compelled herself to press on that they might reach the country. Evening was drawing on. They were dragging themselves through the last street. Seeing a traveller on foot before them, she shot on before her grandfather and began in a few faint words to implore the stranger's help. He turned his head. The child uttered a wild shriek and fell senseless at his feet. It was the village schoolmaster who had been so kind to them before. The good man took her in his arms and carried her quickly to a little inn hard by, where she was tenderly put to bed and where a doctor arrived with all speed. The schoolmaster, as it appeared, was on his way to a new home, and when the child had recovered somewhat from her exhaustion, it was arranged that she and her grandfather should accompany him to the village whither he was bound, and that he should endeavour to find them some humble occupation by which they could subsist. It was a secluded village, lying among the quiet country scenes Nell loved. And here, her grandfather being tranquil and at rest, a great peace fell upon the spirit of the child. Often she would steal into the church and sit down among the quiet figures carved upon the tombs. What if the spot awakened thoughts of death? It would be no pain to sleep here, for the time was drawing nearer every day when Nell was to rest indeed. She never murmured or complained, but faded like a light upon a summer's evening, and died. Day after day and all day long, the old man, broken-hearted and with no love or care for anything in life, would sit beside her grave with her straw hat and the little basket she had been used to carry, waiting till she should come to him again. At last they found him lying dead upon the stone, and in the church where they had often prayed and mused and lingered, Hand in hand, the child and the old man slept together. <laughs> Sleep well, my gorgeous love.